Welcome, and thank you for joining today's Distinguished Speakers Series event at Bakersfield College, hosted by the Bakersfield College Student Government Association, BCSGA, and the Office of Student Life, in collaboration with the Business Management and Information Technology Department. These webinars and many other student events centered are only made possible by the BCSGA KBC Student Services Sticker Program, which students have the option to get at the time of registration. For more information, please visit bakersfieldcollege.edu backslash BCSGA. Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. This webinar is streamed to various social media posts and will be recorded to be made available for students up to two weeks after the event. Closed captioning is available by clicking the closed caption button at the lower part of the screen. This is a webinar event, thus you will not be able to show your video or talk through your mic. The chat feature is enabled through the, uh, the Zoom portal. Please use it to engage with other panelists and attendees. All in inappropriate questions or comments will be removed immediately. To pose a question in the lower part of the screen, you will see a Q&A button. This is to submit your questions to us. We will also receive questions via the social media outlets. We will review the questions and ask them at the end of the speaker's presentation. We may either respond to the question live or respond to it via the modules. The Distinguished Speaker Series brings community leaders from around the world to Bakersfield whose achievements have had national and or international significance. Each speaker was proposed by BCSGA by either a department or a faculty member. Collaboration between many entities on campus makes these events successful each year. The events are free and open to the public. All events this year are scheduled to the, via a Zoom virtual platform. For more information on future speakers, please visit bakersvillecollege.edu backslash student events backslash DSS. Please note today's webinar is recorded. In case of technical issues, please stay online as we work through them. In case of disconnection, please join us live on Facebook Live at facebook.com backslash SGABC. If you have any questions to ask, during the presentation, please submit them by the Q&A module so the moderator will be able to respond live or at the end of the presentation. You may also pose your questions on social media outlets and we can capture those questions there. As a reminder, we'll have another presentation at 2 p.m. Please visit Bakersfield College backslash student events for more information. Without further delay, I welcome Professor Hal Mendoza, Professor of Business Management and Information technology to introduce today's speaker. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Hal Mendoza. Uh, Gordon Bellamy is a visiting scholar at the USC Games and head of the USC Bridge Incubator Program, helping to cultivate the next generation of leaders in the craft of game development. He's played key business and product leadership roles at Tencent, Electronic Arts, as a designer on Madden F. NFL football and MTV and consulted for numerous companies in the industry. He's the 2018 recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Game Developers Conference and was featured on Nickelodeon for Black History Month for his 25 plus years of contributions to the game industry. Gordon is currently the president and CEO of the Gay Gaming Professionals and is on the board of directors for The Way VR. Bellamy has served as executive director of both the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences and the International Game Developers Association. Please join me in welcoming Gordon Bellamy. Hello, and, and, and thank you, Hal, and thank you, um, Nikki. Uh, really privileged to be here. Hello, Bakersfield College. Uh, good morning. Thank you for waking up with all of us today. Um, I mean, yeah, just a, a, amazing times. Let's just spend a morning together. We're gonna to talk about, about games. Uh, so for me, let me get my slide here going. Here, So I know for me, um, whenever there's a talk, I love to know the table of contents so that I know where we are in the talk um, and how far along it is. That's just one of my personal things. So I'd like to share that with you. So we're gonna talk about a little bit of my origin story and you, and you got a bit of my bio um, there from Professor Mendoza. And we're going to talk about history of esports, talk about esports and games and education. And we're going to talk a bit about equity and you and, and your ability to impact things. And, and of course, this talk 
is a service to y'all. So all questions are welcome. Um, and you know that's that's the whole point. Especially now, I think in this this year, we've learned right. We all just have to do our our best for each other. So I'm here for you. All questions welcome. But without further ado, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. So my origin story. Uh, so I come from a family of lawyers, and by that I mean um, my father is an attorney, my brother's an attorney, and. I was actually named after my dad's law school professor, Professor Richard Gordon. Uh, so as you can imagine, there were some expectations set for me. And I think I imagine that some of you know what that's like to have expectations set for you and want to go and find your own voice in the world. Uh, so I studied engineering um, at Harvard. I was gonna be an environmental attorney. I studied water treatment and uh, very important how to make clean water. And that's what I thought was my path was gonna be. And I'll tell you exactly what happened and how I ended up you know, here with you today and on my path. Uh, we took a field trip. We took a field trip to the water treatment plant. And there we learned exactly how they turn like returned sewage and other dirty water into the drinking water that we drink. Now, I, it's a very important process and I, and I hold everyone there in high regard, but that day I knew that that wasn't me. Like that wasn't where I want to be. I didn't want to be the boss. I didn't want to be the entry level. That wasn't my identity. And part of the reason you go to college, like all of you are, is to choose your own path and have agency in who you become and, and how you impact the world. So I love two things a lot. I love sports and I love video games. And so that's what I wanted to do. And so when I realized I was not gonna be an environmental attorney, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do sports and video games. Back in my day, um, there were two main places that I could see going. So there was a fledgling TV network called ESPN. And there was a fledgling game company doing something called EA Sports. And so I applied to both. And I'm sure a lot of you are going through that process yourself. And so I applied, got my resume together, sent it off to HR, and I heard nothing. And, you know, I, I thought there was, you know, some mistake. I was putting my passion out there in the world. I would you know, call the HR department just to be sure they received my resume. But sure enough, um, there was no internship waiting for me at either place. And so I was at a real fork in the road because I wasn't gonna go down this environmental attorney path and I hadn't heard back what I wanted to hear from EA or from ESPN. So what am I gonna do? Well, in my case, pressure made diamonds. Uh, what I ended up doing was there's a game you see on screen there called NHL hockey actually have it here with me because it's a big part of my life. Um, and I ended up cold calling every single person in the credits for NHL hockey at their desk. Um, and I'd call like, hi, this is Gordon, click, hello. I'm an engineer from Harvard, click, hello, I love your game, click. And I, I called every single one. And um, finally, got down around to the special thanks and got to a, a person named Jim Simmons who believed in my passion and was like, hey, you know, you sound really authentic. I really believe you want to be here. I can get you an interview for an entry level job at Electronic Arts um, in quality assurance, uh, which is like, you know, testing uh, games that are under development, software that, that's broken, that has bugs. And so that was the, the door opened for me. And so I literally uh, saved up, got a plane ticket from Boston and came out here to California where we all are with my backpack um, all in for one interview for one moment. Uh, no, no plan B. Uh, and so I got there and the way that you test for QA back then was trial by reality. 
they literally give you a piece of alpha software. So for uh, those of you who are not in the CS, so in alpha software in games means all the features are in, but there's there's bugs in it. Uh, and they let you test. They put you in there with a with a pad of paper and say, just show us what you got. Show us your ability to perceive bugs and problems. Now, by good fortune, I got a game called Bulls versus Blazers. So as you know, my passion, sports and games, it was a dream come true. It all played out like you would imagine in a, in a montage from a film. And that was the start of my career. That was my break. Um, so um, I went back to school um, after uh, applying for the internship and got it. And so I was gonna go there in the summer. And so I decided in my mind, you know, how could I bring the most value to this company and organization, right? Because I was like, I need to, to be EA Sports. This is my one shot. So before I started my summer, I actually went and bought a fax machine and started faxing all the teams in the NFL uh, so that we could have like the most up-to-date rosters <laughs> in the Madden game so that I could arrive and be contributing as much as I could, you know, on day one to the organization that was giving me a shot. Um, and that worked out well for me. I ended up uh, going there, working very hard. Um, I was the global rookie of the year for EA and uh, made my way up the ladder to become the lead designer of Madden football. Yeah, as seen in my bio. And that was great. Um, it was a dream come true. And, you know, I learned so much uh, at Electronic Arts, uh, you know, in that role and other roles. Uh, but I also learned a, a very important lesson. And it's really, really important um, that you learn this young, in my opinion, um, in your careers. And that is this, like, I, I loved EA and I loved Madden, but I didn't have any ownership in it, right? So I was working, you know, very hard and, you know, heart and soul, um, but essentially at a very high level to live someone else's dream. And it's really important I feel that uh, you consider owning your own time and owning your own contributions that you make to things, or at least having a stake in the ownership. And that is why me and my best pal, we started our own business. So we started a business called Z-Axis. And so Z-Axis, because we were making three-dimensional games and 3D graphics. And uh, that decision is the most important one I probably made still to this day, like in my life, because um, we worked equally hard, but because we were growing our own business, we were able to ultimately, we sold it to a company called Activision. And that's what enabled me to, to, to buy my car, to buy our house, to um, have the freedom um, that was earned by working really hard. Um, and I think that, once again, I think that like sometimes the perception is that working with the biggest brand or the biggest company is the ultimate aspiration. But what I hope you'll take from this is that you are the biggest brand and you are what matters, you, your friends, your family, those people that you care about, and just being sure that your hard work is building value for them like as much as possible um, and not just cash value, right? But really like ownership value, like, um, so I did, we did this and that was really great. And we sort of talked about um, my bio a bit. So after that, with that freedom, I was able to begin to give back to our industry. So I, got, I had the opportunity to run both trade organizations for our industry, the International Game Developers Association, as well as the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, which is like the, like the Oscars for games. And both of those roles were about shining a positive light on the development craft 
and on professional developers. And, uh, and those organizations are both super important to this day. Uh, however, the biggest move uh, for me has been entering into education. So uh, like Professor Mendoza and uh, Dr. Domenia, um, I teach. And so I teach at USC Games and I'll tell you, tell you why. Um, it's because of purpose. And so for me, what I love doing is helping people move from point A to point B who don't know how with my abilities and connections. Like that's in fact why I'm here today with you. Like it's, it is really about uh, that purpose. And, and it's, it's once you do that, like that was the purpose that I'm able to live and enact because I was able to attack the challenge of having ownership over my time, right? And that's something I'm just very thankful for. Um, so about USC Games, which is just down the road, and, and maybe some of you will come join us. Um, so the way it's set up is uh, there's two main tracks. There's computer science and design. And inside computer science and design, there's an undergraduate track uh, to get a bachelor's degree and then a master's degree in either of those, either of those tracks. What's become super interesting um, even since I've been there, is that what it means to even be in games has evolved. And by that, I mean, um, even in my role, um, content creation, which is, which is such a huge part for those of you at home who, who watch Twitch or YouTube or follow people on social media, the, the conversation around games has become as important as the design of games, um, as important as the monetization of games, um, and really as important as your agency as player, right? The, the play of games. There is so much, uh, so many people experience our craft um, through the media, um, through Reddit, uh, through word of mouth, uh, that that craft, right, is a legitimate pillar, you know, of games that I focus on. So I teach streaming now. I actually faculty advise uh, the USC Live Streaming Club. Um, another area, and we'll talk about thought, is of course esports. Uh, esports, which all of you who you know are young or is is native to you, um, is now a, a default way of of competition. And in fact, for many young people, esports is much more relevant than. Uh, what I call T sports, like ball sports, football, basketball, baseball, um, or even V sports, and which are like virtual sports, like um, uh, God, I think of like uh, Top Golf, right, or auto racing, where you're able to do the exact same thing in a simulation that you can do um, in real life. Uh, so, what it means to be an educator um, in this space is to understand that you are working with young people like yourselves for whom the, the jobs and careers and interactions that you'll be a part of five years from now, definitely 10 years from now, may not even exist today, right? And it is a very, 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 very interesting, uh, but also fulfilling place to be uh, because uh, the learning, right? The willingness to learn really is the point. It isn't so much anymore like rote learning. And I'll take an example from my childhood. Um, when I was young, we'd learn the states and capitals, right? I can, I can do it right now, Dover, Delaware. But what we really need to learn was what the capitals do. And that's really what education is about today, right? Empowering all of you to navigate the challenges and opportunities of the world that are still forming live like in front of you. One of the things we do to do that is something called the USC Bridge. And um, what the USC Bridge is, it's a program that we have in place that sits uh, between uh, education and professionalism. And by that I mean, uh, 
there's a difference between doing projects with your friends, right, or fellow students, and doing projects for commerce, right? And I think uh, just fundamentally, the customer is different, right? There's a difference between um, authorship, right? Like I've I've created this work, I've written this paper, um, evaluate it, and service which is what most work is nowadays, which is ongoing service to customers, clients, partners. And so we have a program called The Bridge where we have our, our best and brightest projects, like very cool games or very cool game ideas. And we go, how can we now take a whole summer semester and pivot those young people towards service? And going, what does it mean to raise money around this? What does it mean to hire people to work on this? And then lastly, what does it mean to create commerce? What does it mean not only to perhaps sell this game to an to a player, but also to have an ongoing relationship with that audience, right? Whether that be through the game itself and the ever-evolving software or through social media, right? Through the, the brand experience of the games. And we'll talk about more about that later if you're curious. So, um, I love esports specifically, um, and uh, even since my Madden days, before it was you know esports were very big, I've always been passionate about esports, and it's really great now because you have this generation of students who are passionate about esports as well. I mean, who wouldn't be? Um, I mean, in town, well, huh, this slide is now outdated for those of you who are hardcore gamers. We used to have LA Valiant in town and uh, but we have like 100 Thieves we have a lot of League of Legends and there's League of Legends players out there there's a huge and thriving um, esports professional community here and around the Southern California area at USC um, we have varsity esports now in place um, so we have varsity esports around League of Legends Hearthstone Overwatch Smash um, and we have a hybrid student faculty organization that works together to support those varsity athletes and the club communities um, around it, uh, which is really, it's really fun, but what it's become is now also a new professional pipeline because as you know, there's lots of careers in and around esports and some of them are happening like every year, new ones, more and more and more and more opportunities for students to take this passion and make it their professional craft. So um, talk a little bit more about, oops, sorry, slide forward. Me, why games matter to me? So, so everyone, I mean, I, I've been talking this whole thing about following your passion and I can maybe speak to my passion and hopefully as you find an, or have already found yours, this will resonate. So for me personally, um, I'm African-American and as you know, I'm CEO of the Gay Game Professionals. I'm also gay. And what that has meant was that I was raised with a different set of rules for navigating interaction, for navigating social situations, for navigating the world. Um, uh, obviously, we're now in the midst of celebrating Black History Month, which is awesome. Um, and games were the one place where the rules are always the same for everyone playing, where I could be um, default and not defined by those extrinsic labels, but actually uh, share an experience with others where we all had the exact same set of rules and where I could be as good as I am. So I have always been in games. So there's not like a before time I've been uh, designing games for as long as I can remember for my, my sort of, you know, maybe three, four years old. And I will always sort of be in this space somehow, some way, because I feel and recognize and live how important it is to create default spaces for folks to be themselves and to be who they are and to be able to bring their their whole selves to the world and um so that is i guess the the laser pointer of why games matter to me and informs uh why it's so natural for me to navigate forward in different roles 
around my passion because as you've heard, I was a designer and I've been like an administrator. Uh, I've been a biz dev. I now teach. For me, it's actually all the same thing, right? They're all different facets of the same die. Here's another thing I just want everyone to hear. And gosh, it's so this year or this year plus, it's that you're enough. And um, I think uh, I, the reason I, I stopped to say that is uh, uh, I always, I fear that like there is so much um, external validation that goes on, especially with social media. Um, I can't imagine what it's like to grow up, you know, now with with profiles and and online identities, which can be quantitatively graded continuously. Um, the the simplest example being like uh, if you take a picture from a vacation, well now it has a certain number of likes, which I guess might make it a better picture than a than a picture with fewer likes, um, but none of those are the actual memory of what the picture is, which just sort of sits inside of you. And I, it's so, I, I feel important to reflect on that and to recognize that you're enough before the sort of validation of others, you know, before, I mean, once again, stay in school, do great, but before you get your grades and, yeah, before um, the world judges you that, yeah, that you're enough as you are. Um, yeah, I just want to show that. So history, a little bit of esports history for you. And I'll go through this fast because this is the way back, but I think it's important to know. So for those who are passionate about games, so back in the day, like back in the 70s, 80s, when I was coming of age, games were isolated arcade experiences. So the the video game market was dominated by arcades, which, I mean, knock on wood, were places where people could go together as groups, right, and play physical video games together. Um, so you can see some pictures up here. You don't remember Donkey Kong, Pac-Man. Trust me, these were very, very, very popular games um, back in the day and were actually the, the birth of esports. So the, the very first competitive event was actually held here in California back in 1972. Um, and that's where players played a game called Space War. And the top prize for the, for the competition was a one-year subscription to Rolling Stone magazine. A magazine, of course, a set of papers stapled together. But, but, um, but uh, that was the birth of, of this era. And, and the next biggest thing was an Atari Space Invaders competition, which attracted 10,000 players. And you can see the picture there in the middle. It was, it was huge, and it was the first thing to bring video games out of niche into the public eye. It was the first time people had seen this being people gathered around video games because video games were something that people played uh, like in a dark arcade or alone at home. Um, in the 90s, um, there was a new era of competitive gaming, and it was the birth of PC games being like a leader in the space. So the biggest thing that happened back then, those big breakthrough moment, uh, gosh, was this game um, called Quake, and it had the first true esports event. It was 2,000 entrants online, and the top 16 players went to the competition called the E3 Expo, and the winner won a Ferrari 328 GTS owned by one of the programmers. And so uh, that was, you know, the, like people thought there was no way esports could get any bigger back then. Um, but they did. As we moved into the 2000s, we crossed over to the first time where there was like a million dollars in prize money across the universe of esports. Also, you saw the rise of esports in South Korea. So one of the great things about South Korea was, is that they have a fantastic um, internet infrastructure. And what that afforded was a culture of ongoing competition that was fair and equitable around video games. And so esports boomed, boomed 
in South Korea, and, and to this day, rem- remain a, remains a huge part of game and play culture in a way that's not even here in America. Over that decade, there were like maybe 10 tournaments in 2000. There were 260 by the time we got to 2010, including like Intel Extreme Masters, heard of that, or Major League Gaming. So why all the growth? Accessibility, internet cafes, and then home computers, and the beginning of Nintendo's home console for everyone made it like more cost effective for people to play. So like cost it was a, is and remains a big barrier to entry for people playing games together. Uh, not everyone can afford like a home PC computer and high speed internet. A lot more people in America can afford consoles. Meanwhile, in South Korea, for example, PCs were more publicly available in PC bongs. And so over there, the culture of games revolved around PC. Then the 2010s. This is where things really changed because television is one thing. Twitch and Facebook, as you know, are an entire other thing. And what they provided is the peak in accessibility for folks. Anyone with an interest in esports today literally after this talk, during this talk, can go on to Twitch right now and see online content. And when Amazon bought Twitch in 2015, they integrated the streaming service into a conglomerate that is a big part of our lives. So, I mean, the fact that Amazon, which for old people started off as a book company, right? And Amazon Shopping is integrated into Twitch viewing is something that has enables it to reach so many lives in so many ways that now like esports and of course streaming are pervasive and of course what you've seen happen is that people have discovered other better broader uses of gameplay for streaming and now streaming is is everywhere so um the biggest games for those of you who are new to esports, are League of Legends and Dota 2. And why are these the biggest games? I think there's a few reasons. Um, one, they're free. They're free to play, yet they're still strategically complex. So there is a great, deep, rich engagement curve. Like once you get into these games, there's always more to learn. There's always more characters. There's always more to talk about in the nuance of playing these games. Um, the League of Legends World Championships, well, gosh, once again, it's so interesting. I see these slides and I you know, long for these days. Uh, they used to brag about how they took place in big arenas. What they really talk about now is the incredible global audience for these, for these games and the growth in the revenue. So, of course, if you remember the Rolling Stone subscription where we started, well, now the prize pool for Dota's International is well over $25 million. So things have grown. And of course, there's other games now like Overwatch and Valorant and Fortnite and CSGO and Smash Brothers, all of which have healthy ecosystems around around their games. So I see here, I've got deep in the stats. I'm gonna just keep going forward. Esports in your future. Like, so, Here's what's happening and you're, you're living it. So streams are breaking free of the internet and becoming integrated in with major networks as well. So you'll see ESPN, where I was wanting to start. <laughs> ABC uh, are now tr- integrating esports into their programming. And the reason that they're normalizing it is because of you. Uh, because for young people, Esports in many ways are replacing digital sports. One of the reasons that they replace it is because everyone can play. It's accessible. Like all of us can play Smash Brothers or League of Legends or Dota. We can't all play football. And that's a fundamental change in the world of just the the equity of across across gender and across uh, location for everyone to be playing the exact same game. Um, there were 128 plus college varsity esports programs across North America. Um, over 100 of them provided scholarships uh, for students. And that's always super exciting um, to see that sort of support. Uh, we in fact provided scholarships with GGP for 
people who uh, who support esports. It's like so for like ed, for student administrators at different programs. Um, at our school, for example, we have like ten core staff. We've got about fifty varsity players and about three hundred young people in our clubs supporting those sports. So the next generation for us is embedded already um, into the gaming ecosystem. So jobs, uh, all of us want them. And, oh, do I have a favorite Twitch streamer? I do, Betty, I see that. Oh, sorry, so quick question. So face, do I have a favorite Twitch streamer? Well, um, I like a lot of streamers. Um, something that's interesting that's happened uh, with us at USC is one of our creators has become a bit of a star in Minecraft. Um, something called Dream SMP, uh, named Eret. So Eret was a student, and or is a student, and now is a very popular streamer. So I'm always rooting for our for our own young people who are thriving. But I love lots of streams. Um, and now, I mean, I watch a lot of music streams and game streams. Um, God, who do I? I subscribe to so many. Um, who would I recommend to you? Um, you know what? I'll recommend our own kid. Yeah, watch Eret. Yeah, Eret's great. Um, anything with the Dream SMP, a lot of fun. The, the Minecraft is fun. It's lighthearted, relatively family friendly, good stuff. Um, let's see here. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, the questions are welcome. That's totally cool. Um, so, but jobs. Um, I was talking before this talk briefly with Professor Mendoza. It's a super interesting time because many of you are coming from a place of, of school from home into work from home. And, and that's okay. Um, because especially in esports and in games, that's actually relatively neat. We're digital formats, right? And so uh, I think many of the companies in our space were the first to adapt to these times in which we live and the times of the future where there's gonna be an expectation that you have the choice to work from home at least part of the time, uh, I think that although the um, the external circumstances which have forced this are very negative, I think that some people are finding some positives in their work family time balance um, by being able to work you know from their home space. So there's jobs of all kinds. So of course a lot of people talk about playing. But I just want to talk about some other roles. So business development, doing deals, marketing, of course, game development itself. Which hopefully many of you are interested in um, production, which is the, essentially the high level of the project management of games. Uh, sponsorships, right? How do we bridge games with other crafts, right? Like who does the, the work to bring a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or a Gatorade or a Red Bull um, or G Fuel? into the space and many, many more. Um, and I really feel esports builds important life skills. So these are four of them and which are of course teamwork, professionalism, problem solving and flexibility, which I think will serve you well in any field that you work in. But if you love video games, what a great place to learn about them. Uh, I think one of the really great things that um, that esports forces upon young people working in it is time management, because their days are always packed making esports events happen. Uh, the problem solving is so dynamic and dimensional because there are people involved, there is technology involved, there is play and audience involved. And you find yourself uh, using your mind to work with lots of different kinds of people with different skills, with different communication styles to solve problems. And so once again, I feel it's a great area to develop yourself professionally for wherever your career may take you. And I feel as though it benefits your education, um, at least at our school. So. For example, uh, Kuyana, who's one of my student assistants, who is awesome, and in fact, helped me with this presentation. She, not only does she manage the Overwatch team scheduling and well-being, like mediating team conflicts and leading group outings and team bonding, she's now the art lead 
on game projects and uses her social and organizational skills from esports to manage her art team on her video game, right? And like, I'll talk a little bit, Andrew. So Andrew um, was assigned to lead one of our events, which is our Overwatch Carnival. And he managed it despite it being his first time handling an event, like, which was that size, which is about 50 to 100 people. But he was able to bring that into his work as a team game designer to lead his team on a glass class game project. And so once again, I feel as though, um, or I know, right, that esports aren't just play. They're a fantastic space for you to learn skills that you'll be able to apply in a host of spaces. And it's constantly evolving and constantly learning. Um, there's new roles happening all the times. Um, there's new games happening all the time. And uh, as this new generation of like high school and collegiate grassroots esports grow, there's a whole new generation of people for whom the language of esports will be native. And I think that just going forward, the same way that we used to always teach people to play traditional sports to learn team building and teamwork, that esports are going to be for you going forward one of the ways to develop those skills. But it's important to remember yourself. So self care, gosh, especially, especially now. Um, this is a quote from Quiana, who I was just telling you about. But something that can happen um, in a number of fields, but especially esports and especially in these digital times, is because of passion, people can overcommit. And by overcommit, I mean being constantly available, whether it be you know on their Discord uh, and all the different channels uh, that you can people can always reach you. And it's so important to define like a work-life balance and set boundaries and set like beginning of day, end of day times so that you don't get burnt out giving your all to, to esports or to anything nowadays. It's really like, yeah, that's a, a, just a very important point um, to, and it's a challenge because these are new times, right? We're sort of figuring out uh, the best practices. All of us are figuring it out live together. And I would just, yes, put out to you that yes, setting boundaries for yourself because it's so easy to be always available will be super important to your long-term growth and development and to be able to enjoy these things, find joy in them for a long, long, long time. And esports is ready for you. So jobs, a great site to go to, hitmarkerjobs.com. They're posting from hundreds of companies, from tens of countries, you know, on there all the time. And I a wide variety of jobs. I One of my favorite jobs was when the Philadelphia Fusion was hiring a meme specialist for $17 an hour. But from writing social media posts to being on camera to, to managing events, there's something for everyone. And the opportunities are there. Um, you just got to go get them. Um, I put on here Sabrina Wong, I'm so proud of her. So she uh, went to UC Riverside, but then went from UC Riverside to Blizzard, from Blizzard to LA Valiant to 100 Thieves, Evil Geniuses, and now has even sparked her own businesses. She has her own fashion line around esports culture um, while also being an esports executive. Uh, there was just a wonderful world. Like none of those things would have existed back when she started in college where y'all are. But I just feel as though we're going to open so many doors for you going forward. So you, um, like I've said, younger people are much more interested in esports than traditional sports. It's organic. You understand it. Um, it's really more of a generational thing. People who ridicule um, esports and gaming. Um, it's gaming now is a fantastic breeding ground for diversity. Um, as we mentioned, it's a shared experience. It's accessible to all and you're becoming more and more accessible, especially now that physical hindrance is not a thing. Um, and 
I mean, the generational divide is really okay. I think that like violent contact sports are not necessarily always good for you. I think that um, that you know, yeah, concussions bad. And playing games and meeting others and making friends uh, across the world good. I think it's so um, meaningful that we're able to have shared experiences with people across the globe and have shared understandings and positive outcomes that are not defined by where you're from. And that is something super unique um, to esports as a culture, which by definition, like brings together people across like boundaries and borders of all kinds, um, and values, you know, inclusion. Plus, it's super fun. So, how can we emulate the success of games? Right? How can you grow the future? Um, the I think to think about is this. Um, games and esports, though they're not innocent by any means, have been able to begin to break away from a lot of the biases um, and traditional beliefs around like gender and identity. I think that uh, there is a, a creativity uh, that is possible in play um, and in digital play, which is unprecedented. There's never been anything like it for folks. Um, I think that for you, you know, disrupting, yeah, the 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 historic roles that have been put upon you is is something that you're able to do in the game space and give you the opportunity to grow the future. Um, and I know a lot of you are, but I'd just say, just continue to think about expanding your awareness to foster inclusion and diversity and just meaningful engagements in games and play. And especially as you form organizations and groups, just be thoughtful about how inclusive uh, you can be, um, how you can uh, be leaders in, in gender equity and expression, and really define leadership for yourselves. So why diversity? I obviously talk about a lot, but I think diversity makes us strong. And diversity is critical to both creative and business and really life endeavors. It's, it's not just like something to check off. It's the outcome of, of justice, of, of treating each other uh, with respect and treating everyone as valuable as they are as people. So wrap up. Change starts with you. Um, there's things you can do every day. Um, gosh, it's so important. Um, I was talking once again with the professors about this. Like the world is acting on you and putting a host of constraints, you know, on all of us and limits that did not exist before. And so it's more important than ever that you act on the world in a positive way and you act on the world uh, to make it better in the ways that you can. Um, because I know that you have potential and that you are valid and you matter. And as I said, you're enough as you are. So questions, let's talk, let's talk about games. And here's my contact info. So yeah, normally if we were on campus back in past times, I would just stay on campus, we'd just talk. But these are digital times. I want you to be able to reach me. Here is my Twitter. Um, here is my Instagram. Here is my LinkedIn. Uh, I encourage you to add me. Thank you. And if we have any questions, or we'll talk shop. Okay. Well, there are a few questions. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Um, Magdalena asks, "How old does one need to be to make and publish a game?" How old does one need to be? Oh, um, well, I think the question isn't to publish a game, it's to have a relationship with customers, right? Which are two different questions. So I would seriously suggest that, that although you could make a game at any age, 
I would not suggest publishing a game until you know someone is at a point where where they're either they're an adult, right? Or they have some parental adult supervision in interacting with customers, right? With people who are gonna be playing their game, who are gonna be commenting on their socials, who are gonna be interacting with them with the expectation, you know, of being a customer. But you should always make games, right? But yeah, there's a, there's a difference between, yeah, between ah, just like setting up a lemonade stand, right? Lemonade stands are set up with parental supervision because you're interacting with the world, right? Uh, I think that really the, that's the same rules apply um, that ev- there should be, there should be an adult. Yeah, I feel strong. There should be an adult dealing with the business transactions around games, but you could at any, at any point make games or contribute to games, art, audio, anything designed at any age. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, uh, Trey asks, Mr. Bellamy, with the expectation from your family to be an attorney, sure. what was their reaction to the change of career direction and what is their take on it now? That's a great question. Um, that's a great question. So I'll, I'll there's two parts to that. So, um, you know, I spent a lot of years chasing that validation, Trey. So I'll tell you, I remember like, um, so Madden showed on the Super Bowl, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, look, the game, what I do, it's on the TV. Look at, look at, look at. And, and they were like, you know, that's cool. You know, you can really understand those contracts better with a law degree, right? Um, here's, here's what I, here's what I would offer would be my, my life advice, right? Which is this, um, at some point you have to run your own race. If you let someone else run your race, at some point you won't have any race left to run. Okay. And that is, that sort of comes from the inside, right? Like at some point you have to be accountable for how you are going to live your life, how you're going to treat yourself and how you can interact with others, right? When you're a child, you're not accountable because parents, da, 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 right? But as an adult, at some point, that's something it can be hard, right? Because everyone, you know, wants validation, but you have to be one of the people in the room who counts as a valid, as a validator, as a validator. Um, And so, to literally answer your question, I'd say, work in progress. My brother's still a lawyer, my dad's still a lawyer. They know him. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, like all the things in the world doesn't, um, doesn't diminish their truth. Um, but I think I have my own conviction in myself, you know, and how I'm living. So that's what I lean into. That's great. Yeah, we appreciate your your openness and yeah. answer these questions. Sure, no worries. Glad to. Um, what uh, what do you think about all this hoopla that's surrounding GameStop? Got any the hoopla? About that? Um, I have no insight on the hoopla. I think the I mean I think that's like anything where the it's it's in the details, right? And I think a lot of people are having very different experiences. Um, and that those experiences aren't per se even about GameStop, <laughs> I guess would be what I'd put it. I don't think GameStop is the actual topic. I think GameStop just happens to be the, 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 it'd be like the Battle of Waterloo is not about Waterloo, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if that makes any sense, <laughs> right? Like, I don't, I think that the, the very real um, and complex issues um around GameStop, I guess I would respectfully say that that different people are having different experiences and it will be time before we even see the outcome, right, of how people were affected by their involvement or lack of involvement, right, um, in GameStop investment. I'll put it. Okay, thank you. Right. Lots of questions coming sure. in. Sure. Oh, I see. I see a whole. Uh, let me let me storm through these. Did okay. I geek out when Ninja appeared in a commercial with Peyton Manning? Do you mean did I geek out when Peyton Manning appeared in a commercial with Ninja? Because video games, number one. Um, yeah, I I I go. Um, 
it is great when there's when game people are able to reach broader audiences as a window into into games. Um, that's cool. Um, was it significant to me personally? Um, sure, because we can talk about it, right? It's a way to talk to new people and to 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 bring them into to games and uh, understanding like, is he a game player? Is he a game maker? Is he an engineer? Like, like to at least understand that there is a, a whole world of people around games. Um, what are my thoughts on Discord and gaming? Amazing. I'm on Discord right now in about 98 channels. I teach in Discord. Okay, this is a really specific thought. So Discord is great for teaching because I'm able to democratize asking questions across different communication types, which by which I mean, if I just leave it to raising hands, well then very aggressive, often male students will demand their time, like demand to have their question answered. And then we'll just sit here and go like this until they get it answered. And then people who are quiet, people who are thoughtful, right? Even people who are amiable will not get an equal chance to ask their questions. Also, students who are brilliant and English is their second language get a chance to formulate their questions and be as smart as they are because they can write it in Discord and not be performing in English, just thinking and asking what they want to ask. And so I'm huge on Discord. I, Discord is, is bay. When else did you, did you ever imagine something like Discord existing? Well, things like Discord have always existed. I mean, there's always been ways to chat online. Um, what, what they didn't have as easily was the, was the ability for you to share your identity across different communities so effectively while chatting and they didn't have like the video integration, like people having the in, the internet speed for video has been transformative, right? This, ah, hey professors, I mean, we're on a video call from different cities in real time to educate X number of people. Like this didn't, you know, this is post Star Trek, right? Like this is better than beat me up Scotty. This is like, oh, what do you see down there? I'll just show you a video, right? Like this is, yeah, this is, now and, and fantastic and then cyberpunk issue there are multiple issues with with cyberpunks so i don't know which issue you're asking about but i would say that we're all learning from the cyberpunk uh, experience and many people have had a fantastic time playing it so there it is oh and thank you cheryl sorry back to you hal sorry okay i just um, stormed through those questions like boom benny like that excellent um Kara asks, I says, she says three questions. In terms okay. of equity, what is being done to make games more accessible for people with disabilities, specifically those that affect the hands, vision, and hearing? I guess okay. that's your first question. All right. Well, let me get A out of the way and so and go lead the expertise. So there's an organization called Able Gamers. And let me see if I can find put the link if I can put link in the chat. Uh, who lead the charge they, they are who i trust like able gamers is all about all about um enabling and not not just uh including but empowering accessibility um for people um who are coming who are yeah who are friends who are family here let me put it can i put it in the chat let's see here control c ablegamers.org um but to answer your question in the best way possible, that's what's, there are other organizations, but this is where I would start, like for real, like they're so awesome. Um, yes, sorry, oh, there are two, two more questions, sorry. Uh, it looks like uh, COVID has revealed a really big inequity in terms of access to technology. What is the gaming industry doing to help close that digital divide? That's your second question. Ooh, that's a, that is a guru. <laughs> that's a heavy. That's a heavy lifting question, right? That is almost like healthcare for all. There are two divides happening, at least. Okay, the the healthcare divide would be what I'd be, if it were I'm just gonna put out there, more concerned about, right? Because right now, right, we're literally trying to get a vaccine out to X number of people, right? And how people are able to get access to even the information about it is a digital divide. Um, I think that um, even for learning, like you're here in this talk, right? But imagine a world where you don't have high-speed internet or imagine a world where you don't have your own device 
inside a household to just watch what you want, right? To engage how you want. Um, like the the disparity, right? Which is being created like every day by this is bigger than a games problem. That is a a global like the the global digital divide crossed with time, which is happening right now, is is if it has not already going to turn into a huge socioeconomic divide, right? Because remember, you can't even apply for a job right now if you can't get a computer. You couldn't even forget. Oh, I'll just stop by and put my resume on the on the at the secretary's desk. Nah, right? That does not exist. So. So the, the, the divide which is being, which is happening right now is, is uh, we won't know the measure of it for, for years to come. And is games as an industry do anything about that? I think that that's actually not per se a games problem. That's actually a access, it's more like access to water and you'd be asking like, what is Coca-Cola doing about access to water? And I go, no, 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 there's a, there'll hopefully be a cultural demand like that. We need to have, you know, internet basic right, you know, because of all these things that you can only get access to via the internet now. So uh, that's my question, but it's a great question. Um, like, like digital civil rights, Ugh, like that's a whole area that did not exist Right. Like, in fact, you remember, like, uh, maybe a few minutes, not minutes, months ago, it used to be like, oh, some people like, oh, I don't even have a cell phone. I don't even have this. Now would be like a like a thing to do. But now, pff, whoops, you better get one because digital times. Sorry. Question three, though. OK. <clears throat> question three. Finally, sexism is a common experience for women as well yes. as non-binary GNC people in gaming. Yes. Are there any initiatives or more structural educational efforts to make gaming a more inclusive and welcoming environment? Gotcha, great question. So you're talking about systemic bias. Um, so systemic bias exists, once again, bigger than games and specifically inside of games. Um, I will tell you me and my own, my own journey and what I'd recommend to you, okay? Default spaces. So by default spaces, I think I talked about this a little bit, it's places where you don't have to ask the qualifying questions that you navigate um, being non-binary or being female before getting to be as awesome as you are, right? And so whether it be through gay game professionals, which I welcome you to join, we do lots of great, we're gonna be on the front page of Twitch this February and March. Um, um, follow us on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, there's Women in Games International. There are a number of organizations which are about creating default spaces, right? Default spaces afford growth to leadership. Growth to leadership affords decision-making. It's only through, once again, going back to my talk, ownership of things that you get to systemically make things better for folks, right? And taking inclusion as an example, there's a big difference between experiencing inclusion and being inclusive. Right. And I believe what you're actually talking about is how do we empower uh, ourselves to be inclusive, right? Versus how do we externally be included, right? Because if you're being included, well, that means you could also be excluded at any time because you're not making the rules. You're just benefiting from a moment of inclusion in something that's not yours. <laughs> Soapbox off. <laughs> I hope that begins to answer your question. Okay, so um, yeah, we have quite a few uh, audience questions here. Oh, okay, sure. Whatever. Yeah, I, I can't see them, so you tell me where to go. Yeah. Okay, so here's one again from Trey. Sure, Trey. I know there are constant changes with gaming software, and I'm sure you're constantly learning. How long did it take to get the hang of programming? <gasps> That's a great question. Programming is a lifelong journey. Right, it's a lifelong journey. I think Professor Mendoza can speak to the fact that what programming even means is evolved, you know, in our lifetimes and will continue to evolve um, going forward. 
um, today, if I was to get like a to laser focus on something today, I'd start learning Unity, right? Not because Unity necessarily will be forever, but it's a bit of a lingua franca, right? Amongst many, many people who are making games, right? Um, but none of it is the end point. Like what you learn in a curriculum, which will be the most important thing, will be an openness to new languages, like to be a, a polyglot, right? Of engineering. Uh, and that I think is the skill. That's one skill. The other skill, which will be super important, as important as getting the hang of coding, will get, get in the hang of working with others. Okay, like going forward, there's going to be fewer and fewer roles, which are like solo practitioner. I'm the specialist in this, but don't need to really healthily engage with other people in order to create greater experiences. Right. The same way that games are so networked, I feel as though the development of games is so networked that working on group projects is probably the biggest single skill that I'd actually want to have going forward even if you don't per se code that well, be able to work well with others will afford you the opportunity to keep working on projects while you work on your, your coding skills, which are going to always evolve. But if you can't work with other people, it won't matter how good you can code. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for a couple more. Sure. sure. I got time. Okay. <laughs> you, you got time. <laughs> I'm not sure how long this is scheduled for, but... Uh, I'll ah, give some more questions. Are there a lot All of right. questions? You well, tell me. Let's try. Let's try our best. Okay. Trey asks and one more. Sure. Says, are you working remotely? And if you are, do you find yes. it more difficult and challenging, or is it easier with the loss of more physical interactions with coworkers? It's different. It's different. Um, I think that it is harder um in that this is not by choice. Right? And so I think when the world tells you you can't go to the to to, to just the, to co-locate um i'll tell you the real part that's harder like super harder okay it's this um reading other people is harder because you have to read a screen right in something that's not a normal interaction so if you can imagine like sitting even when i teach right if you put me in a social situation and said hey gordon you're going to have 40 people all staring at you directly and you need to stare at all of them back and then now interact. That's not something that we're very practiced in, right? Besides if you're in a football huddle, right? Like it's not a normal, like we're learning to do that. And I sort of call it reading the zoom, right? Like it's the, what does it mean if you turn your camera off, right? What does it mean, right? If you change your background, you know, and I can't see where you are. What is like, there's lots of social cues that you can't read even necessarily like body language the same way that we as humans are super good at, right? We're super good at seeing if someone's power, you know, like how someone feels about what we're saying that have been totally cut off by this camera interaction. And so I guess for me, like I'm very like a people person. Yeah, in that way, it's harder. Um, it's also harder to do something as simple as like small conversations, like let's quickly break out into a room or let's quickly share the floor effectively because there's like a new awkwardness to who gets to talk next that we as humans have learned around a dinner table how to talk. I don't think we have had a lot of dinners around a Zoom and so we know how to have a conversation in the same way. Um, so those are negatives. I think um, positives. Everyone's finding their own way, but I think that uh, that the control over those digital modalities for some people really does help them because they'll be like, oh, I just need to stop this camera for a second, right? I'm not mad at you. I just need to stop the camera for a second so I'm not serving you <laughs> all those social cues. <laughs> um, and maybe that's better. Maybe some arguments have been avoided, right? You know what I mean? Maybe some, you know, maybe some embarrassing moments. Of, you know, the, uh, your generation is going to teach us about this. Like, really, like the etiquette, the social norms, like what's right, what's wrong, is going to be born out of a whole 
generation of young people who came of age in Zooms, right? Zoomers. They don't even have your own name, right? It's not boomers, it's Zoomers. So it's not up to me. <laughs> what is better, better or worse? Sorry, next question. But good questions, Trey. But next question. All right, there's a question in the chat. Sure. Oh, above here. Oh, what do I think about Google Stadia? And was it Google's fault for letting it fall out? Letting it all out. Um, so what everyone's talking about here, so Google Stadia is a platform and they just shut down first party development. I believe that's what you're asking about. Um, that just happened like today. So I don't know. I, I find like, I find pointing blame at folks is, doesn't propel anyone forward. What I do think is that I hope that all those people, human beings are able to find work, right? Cause they're all trying to eat food this month. And so like just real talk, like I don't, ultimately I don't care, Google's rich, right? I think there's a number of individuals who I hope that there's an opportunity as an industry to collectively lift them up and be like, hey, we get it. All of you need to eat food. What can we be doing as an industry to help you eat food and feed your families in the months ahead, right? Like there's no, I mean, I would say whoever's asked question, it's a pandemic. There's no time for schadenfreude. Like there's really only time to do what we can to lift each other up, like, period. Okay. <clears throat> well, we have a question here. Sure. Thank you. From, uh, what are your thoughts on open source software in video games? Okay, it's a broad question. Um, open source is great. Like, look, democ democratization is sharing. Here's what I love about open source, right? What open source says is that once again, the things that divide us, like I'm from California, you're from Nevada. You're from Nevada, you're from Timbuktu. You're from Timbuktu, that's weird, I'm from Sweden, right? Guess what we all have in common? Open source software, right? And that we can all be additive to something that we all share is such a fundamental world value that we need right now that I'm like, yes, like, you know, the more the more projects, the better, the less like this isn't even political. I'll just say this is facts, right? So our nations are battling over resources to make vaccines, right? And to purchase them so that we may live. Okay. You would think, right, that this is a global question, right? And that everyone would be like, come by ya. How do we just get the most vaccine out to the most people? Because you know living right but it's actually seen as like a, na a national question right and i think the same thing like of games and play like the more questions that we can see as human which is what open source does like open source means oh it's open source if you're human then you contribute to the code well pff, yeah i hope there's some stuff that we all use that is open source that'd be like the best thing to happen for like the world right like, it doesn't matter what it is. Could be our alarm clock, could be the microwave timer, doesn't matter. But if we knew it was open source that anyone in the world could be contributing to it, that would be like, it'd be like if we all went to the moon together for the old people, right? Like if everyone helped us go to the moon, right? Like that sort of vibe. That's how I feel, sorry, about open source. All right, thank you. Um... We have one more question sure. and it's from Trey again. Okay, Trey, what's up? Which is the hardest title that you had to do programming and coding on and which one took the longest? Okay, different question. Okay, these are two questions. So, so the hardest, Scott, so this weekend, we were at the Global Game Jam <laughs> making a game and uh, that was probably, the, it was the heart of God. Um, uh, it was great fun. For those you're not familiar, Global Game Jam was an event like this weekend, like 580 sites around the world, all making games on a single prompt. Um, but everyone meeting like on a Friday to finish a game on a Sunday, right? And so the process of uh, getting everyone's roles, deciding what our software implementation would be and our processes, um, evangelizing a design, executing, iterating on it, debugging it, publishing it in two days, it's the, it was the most super pleasurable, but also super hard 
because you just don't have time to cool off, clear heads prevail. There's no time to disagree, no time for all of the human things that you might normally go through over the course of a software process. There's only time to move the software forward. Um, the, yeah, and I think, also with people you've never met before, sorry, with new people, right? Oh, who also, remember, aren't in the same room, so there's no body language, there's no let's share a slice of pizza, you know, there's no let me go for a walk, there's lots of the cadence of humanity removed from it. Um, yeah, that's my answer. That's probably the most complex thing I've navigated. It was, it was great, though. I mean, recommended, but difficult. All right. Great. Well, we really appreciate your talk and your openness and your sure. relating your personal experiences. Cool. We'll stay. I, mean, I think we're back to that. If they want more, we're back. We're back this afternoon. But in the meanwhile, I put my contact info because once again, like even in this format, right? Like some of you out there are quiet and you're thoughtful and you're reflecting on your questions and you'll be like later today or later next week. That's why it's there. Like, I totally welcome your communication style. Like, I get it. Like, asking questions in a group ah, is not for everybody. Cool. All right, then. And thank you. Sorry, Professor Mendoza. Thank you, Dr. Damiana. Thank you, Benny, by the way. Benny probably get the credit, but Benny, making this happen. Thank you, Benny. Thank you. Cool. So I guess it's time for lunch. Self care, <laughs> self care, right? Okay. Or do we? How do we? How do we? How do we wind down? I don't know. What the, actually, what's the? All right. Well, that ends our conversation, and so we'll just uh, uh, exit out the meeting, and then we'll see you all back uh, for the two o'clock presentation. <laughs>